The subject this morning is a call to cease from sin. Uh, love so amazing, so divine, demands my life, my soul, my all, and that we would be willing then to suffer for the name of Christ at any cost. I, I think a, a message much needed in our day and age and in our own hearts. And so I've been praying that the Lord uh, would meet us here in a special way in First Peter chapter 4. I'm just going to read that text and then we will pray. Chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh no longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. For the time already past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lusts, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. And all this, they're surprised that you do not run with them into the same excess of dissipation, and they malign you. But they will give an account to him who's ready to judge the living and the dead. And for the gospel has for this purpose been preached even to those who are dead, that though they are judged in the flesh as men, they may live in the spirit according to the will of God. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we come before you. And Lord, there are many out there now just walking around in this world, just confused and looking for purpose and meaning. And we gather together to hear from the words of the living God. We thank you that we possess the word of God. We thank you that you have given it to us. You've preserved it over all these years. And God, we're asking now that you would illuminate it to every mind and heart. God, what we look at this morning, I pray that, that we would be done with sin. Lord, for any who have come in here this morning and it's just been, they've made a peace treaty with sin. I pray by your word through your spirit, your spirit this morning would convict and there'll be people who will throw this stuff down. And they'll walk out with the commitment that should be for the follower of Jesus Christ. For the will of God is what we live for. God, I pray that you will do that. That you will just come in every heart and minister specifically to each heart through this word. For what they need to hear and what they need to apply this morning. No human can do this. So we pray that this would be your time, God, that you would just minister to your people through the inspired word of God. God, I pray, meet us here in a powerful way. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. If you'll look with me in verse 1, therefore, and I know I'm like a broken record. For those who know what records are, they just, they get stuck and it just would sing the same line again and again and again. And, and to grow in your study of God's word, you have to realize the Bible is not just a bunch of little islands of thought that sit there and they're verses that you memorize on each subject and say, here's what I need for this subject. But it, it's a narrative, especially the New Testament with these logical and connective thoughts that, that link our life and our truth together. And so therefores are very important. God never tells us, just go do this. And everybody's just fighting for, just give me the list. I just want to go do this. And it's, there's always a therefore. He gives indicatives, which are truths and statements of fact, knowing what God has done for you and is doing for you. Therefore, live in light of this. So therefore, knowing these truths, now go live this way. We saw it in 1 Peter 1, uh, chapter 13. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. In light of this gospel in verses 1 through 12 of chapter 1, therefore now, go live a life of hope. Go hope because of this gospel that we've gone over. You have an inheritance that's imperishable and undefiled and won't fade away. Therefore, go hope. Go live a different kind of life. And now we're going to come to another one of those. Bringing together this whole section that we've been in for the last few months. Really probably the whole epistle. And it's that we're going to suffer. 
We're going to suffer, and that is so foreign to Americans to even think that way. Everything is designed to not suffer and how to alleviate it. And now we got someone writing us, inspired by the Holy Spirit, saying, you're going to suffer. You're going to suffer if you follow after Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2.12, keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers... They may, on account of your good deeds as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. So two things are going to happen as you go out and you shine this light in submission to God. When you finally just quit your own will and your own ways and you come under God and you submit to him and his purposes and what he's calling you to and you shine this light in humility as you're persecuted by this world and you respond rightly, they're going to malign you and they're going to hate you, or some are going to turn and glorify God when they get saved because of the light of your life that kept revealing Jesus Christ to them, even when they were ugly and awful to you. So two things are going to happen. They're going to hate you, or they're going to get saved by your light. The example that Peter keeps bringing to us is none other than Jesus Christ. Chapter 2, verse 21. For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. What steps? He committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. And while suffering, he uttered no threats, but he kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed, and you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and the guardian of your souls. 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God. And now we'll come this morning to verses 1 through 6, where Jesus will be where our exhortation is going to come from. And so there's a therefore that's flowing from Jesus Christ. This therefore is flowing as the one who, who died to sin, delivered us from it. We can live now to righteousness. The one who's our example, we can walk in his footsteps. This therefore, just stick it in Jesus Christ in light of who he is and what he's done and what he's doing. Therefore, go live a different kind of life. Because the one who has suffered for us to bring us to God because of the ark that is going to safely bring you through judgment, because you've identified with him in baptism, I'm going to follow Christ. I'm his. I'm one with him. He says, get the same mindset then as your Savior. Have the same mindset as your Lord and the victor. This therefore gives wings to fly for the exhortation that will come to us this morning. So let it land on a heart that is taken up and in the therefore. If you don't have a therefore, this will do you no good. You need to be lost in Jesus Christ and love what he has done for you. Therefore, all we will get without that is failure. You're going to have despondency. You're going to be a little gerbil on the wheel. Does that describe your Christian life? Just a gerbil on a wheel and you're getting nowhere because you do not have a therefore. You have to have that. Every testimony is a therefore. Moralists are trying harder. Let's serve harder. Make yourself do the things you don't really want to do. And is that your Christian life? I want more than that for everyone in this room. As one of your pastors, I want a therefore in every one of your lives. It gives wings to your obedience to God to live a life in light of what he's done and who he is and what he's done for me. Therefore, I want to go live for the one who died for me. So what is Peter after in this section? Well, there's, there's one imperative. There's an imperative in this section, which is a command. And so Peter's going to give us a command, and everything else in these verses is built off of that, and it's, it's flushing out what it means and how we're to do it. And so our, our, our imperative is what we need to narrow in on. And so I want to grow in not throwing imperatives at people without the beauty of therefores and examples, and convincing, and encouraging, and ending by staring at Jesus Christ. 
Don't just throw out imperatives. And, and I, I've had someone say, I want you to share more about parenting. And so I am going to do that this morning. Uh, this is so good for discipling and for parenting. If you're parenting toddlers, you know what they need a lot of? Imperatives. <laughs> Don't touch the socket. You know, all the different things. They need imperatives. And as they age, you know what they need? Therefores. Teenagers need therefores. And they need examples. And they need convincing and encouraging and pointing them to Jesus Christ again and again and again. I am a broken record. Uh, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. I'm going to keep showing you why you should live this life and abandon it. Young kids, why should you abandon your life? Because Jesus Christ is beautiful and he died on a cross in your place. There should be a therefore in light of that. It's not just a bunch of do's and don'ts. It's a bunch of do's. So are you with me? One of my sons, I remember saying, Dad, should I go to this party or not? I think he was in eighth grade uh, with his schoolmates. And I gave him a long answer. And he said, I, I just wanted to know if I should go to this party or not, Dad. <laughs> Dad, can you just say yes or no? I don't want to make this decision. Uh, and I, I wanted him to make it as a therefore. And he made it. And God blessed it. And so we, we want to keep training our kids to live out of their force. Okay? It isn't just for us. It's for anyone you're discipling and anyone uh, of your children. Is I want them to have a therefore to guide and direct their lives. Okay? That was for free. Whoever wanted me to do that, is that good? Okay, I'll do it again next year. <laughs> All right. So what is the imperative? What's the imperative of our section? The imperative is arm yourselves in verse 1 with the same purpose. So, therefore, people who are receiving this letter, you this morning, arm yourselves with the same purpose. That's the main verb. That's the imperative. That is what Peter's after then in this section. That is what the therefore is pointing to. Therefore, in light of what Christ has done, arm yourselves with the same purpose. Look at Christ and all of his suffering. Why is he suffering? Because he's manifesting the truth of God and the gospel message, true righteousness to the people. They're seeing it, they're hearing it, and he's suffering for it. They hate it. They're going to put him to death on a cross. So he's being killed because he's manifesting this beautiful righteousness. And so arm yourselves, Peter says, with the same purpose that Christ had. Not to be a propitiation for sin. That's not what you're to arm yourself with. Not a one-time sacrifice for all. That's not it. That is not what Peter's getting after. This is about the suffering that will come upon you when you live like Jesus Christ in the midst of a hostile and gnarly world. If you will go live this life, you're going to get mistreated and persecuted, and you need the same mindset that Jesus had as he entered this world and was rejected and spit out by it. When you walk in his steps, you will be maligned and persecuted. You will be mistreated, I'll guarantee it. So if you're ever going to get through living in a world like this, like coming against you, hating what you love, it's very hard and difficult. And probably the number one reason why people stay quiet. I don't want that. Or we lash out when we finally get persecuted. And we return evil for evil. Or we try to convince them why they're fools. And, and so there's either I'm just going to be quiet. And if I be quiet, no one's going to come at me. You know how easy it is to, to just shut your mouth and no one will come at you? Some of you have become experts at it. And Peter's telling you, No you got to therefore, and you need to arm yourselves to go out like Christ, live like Christ, and suffer like Christ. It's because we haven't armed ourselves with the same purpose. We have a different purpose. We're trying to get away from it at any cost. And if we arm ourselves and obey this command this morning, I'm going to have the same purpose that Jesus had when he entered into this world. We have come up with a Christianity that allows us to fit in and not suffer. We have figured it out. And that just allows us to all get along and just be happy. Is that why you came to Christ? We don't confront the world in its sin because they'll leave us alone. 
They can tolerate us. They don't have to shut us up if we shut up. If we don't shine the light into their darkness, they won't come against you. They'll actually commend you. Our world loves moralism. And if you can leave it at that, they're going to really like you. You're going to be the good guy in the office. You'll be the nice lady in the neighborhood. Uh, If you leave it there, you, you will get applauded and approved in this world. But we have to obey a command being given to us this morning. If we are ever going to get this, there's a therefore. And therefore, let's try and understand what is being commanded of us. And then I'll give you your outline this morning. But first, I just want to focus in on the imperative. Arm yourselves with the same purpose. The Greek word for purpose, it's, it's a neat word. It carries the idea of the same way of thinking. So arm yourselves with the same way of thinking that Jesus Christ had. And the way that Jesus was thinking, therefore, his purpose. So it's a good translation. Uh, Arm yourself with thinking the way that Jesus was thinking of the purpose of why he entered this world. Why, as he was suffering, what was his purpose? And the context is his sufferings were because he's going to go drink the Father's cup. It was the will of God. And I'm going to go and I'm going to drink that cup of wrath for your iniquities. And I'm going to be an ark that's going to bring you through the wrath of God last week. There's an ark who's going to deliver us from the wrath that's going to come one day upon this earth. And his meekness that he had under persecution would bring some people to salvation like a thief on a cross who said, remember me today in paradise. Because he looked at, I could not believe what he was watching, the way this humble one was suffering. He's just and right and everyone's hurling abuse. And his response causes this man to say, this is the son of God. So I want to arm myself with the way that Jesus was thinking as I suffer. And I want to do the Father's will and not be quiet. And I will not sin, but I'll walk the Calvary road to my finish line like Jesus Christ did. I will walk that path of Calvary's road to the finish line. And by my meekness and my submission and my absolute trust in God, that those who are maligning me along that journey that some would come to see Christ in me and say, what is the hope within you? I want someone to see that. I want them to ask so I can tell them to see them to get on that ark so when the wrath of God comes, they're not outside the ark. That weighs heavy in my heart. I want to arm myself with a suffering Christ setting me free to follow and suffer with him. I want to arm myself with the gospel of the one who died in my place. And I want to arm myself by choosing suffering over silence and not choosing sin over my Savior. I I want to arm myself with that. This is believer's armor kind of stuff that we're looking at. Peter's telling you, put it on. Put on this armor. Get the mindset and the thinking of Jesus Christ as he suffered. Arm yourselves. Arm yourselves with this every morning. All day long, get, get this in your head. Get up every morning as you drive to work or school or wherever you go. Get it on. Put it on. This mindset, how do I think about my life in this world? And I want to think the way Jesus thought as he walked in this world. I want to walk out into a world that hates true righteousness. And I'm going to be tempted to take the easy way out for my flesh. I I want to walk then in the steps of Christ and I want to walk by the power of what his suffering secured in my life. Arm yourselves that Jesus suffered for you and I want to not return evil for evil today and I want to shine the light of Jesus Christ this day and I want people to come to Christ by my witness. I have to arm myself. Are Are you armed this way, guys? Have you armed yourself the way Christ was armed as he journeyed? So what is the secret for enduring persecution? Arm yourselves with the same purpose. So this is your armor. This is your weapon to fight against the schemes of the devil and unsaved humanity. You must be armed. 
And so as an example, if you say, say you, some of you, this is going to be an easy illustration. Say that you have a weapon next to your bed for protection from an intruder who might break into your house. How will that help you if someone jumps you when you're walking to your car that night after class? And you're walking, and it's not going to help you at all to have that next to your bed at home. And many of us leave this weapon next to our nightstand with our Bible. I I, I read my scripture a day to keep the devil away, and now I'm just going to go out into the world. And what good is that going to do you if you don't go out armed with the same purpose? To go out into this world prepared and ready to stand against a world that's going to fight you and hate you. Arm yourself Bring it with you. Be ready. Have this thinking and mindset that Jesus had towards suffering with you as you enter into this world. Some application that I heard this week in my own study, as the the, the preacher said this, uh, you come and say, God loves me. I see it in this word. His approval is all that I need. Uh, This is beautiful. Uh, I love that that I'm finally secure and now I'm going to go to work. And someone at work criticizes you, and you lash out, and you defend yourself. What's the problem? You weren't armed with it. I I understood this, but I didn't arm myself so that when now someone ridicules me, I wasn't armed with, I know that God loves me, and I am so secure, I don't have to defend myself right now in this office. I don't worry about it any longer. How about God is sovereign and wise and good? And I saw it in my study this morning uh, in the Psalms. And every time you get a little twinge in your chest, you're you're terrified. I'm having a heart attack. Every time money looks like it's going to come short this month, I think my bills are greater than what's coming in. You're anxious. The question is then you're not armed. Your gun's in your bedroom. And this is a call to take the truth and to arm ourselves with it every day, and to live into it, to go knowing it, believing it, prepared, ready to go fight. Arm yourselves with this purpose. And so we have to arm ourselves with the same thinking that Jesus had in his sufferings in this world, and that's going to be the rest of this sermon. How do I do that? This is how you take a principle and a command, and now you help people that you're writing to get it. So here's the command, and I want you to get it. I want this morning, I want you to arm yourselves with the same purpose that Christ had. So here's your outline. That was a long introduction. Peter is going to give us, this is a long sermon, six ways. Not two, six. Six ways to arm ourselves with the same purpose as Christ had in his suffering. So I want to arm myself. I get it. How do I do it? Six ways. First, look with me in verse 1. Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh. Why is Peter writing this epistle? To to not lose the forest for the trees. He's writing to saints who are being persecuted severely. So much so, they had to flee their homes and go to different regions. Peter is seeking to help them to think rightly about their suffering to realize what is God's plan for the believer on their journey to glory. How will society view them? How will they treat them? How shall we live in such a world is what this epistle is for. And the first thing here is our whole religion, all of Christianity, is built on the Son of God. The innocent one hanging in the place of the guilty ones on a cross, dying on a, dying on a piece of wood. That's where all of this is built on. A life of suffering, and now he's crowned with a criminal's death. Christ is God's chosen one. His Messiah, the Son of God, is dying on a cross. He suffered. The greatest paradox known to man, God dying on a cross. He suffered in the flesh. He suffered while he journeyed this life. He was hated and he was maligned like no one else on this earth. He was even called the devil himself by some of the religious righteous ones. Arm yourselves with that. Christ suffered. And if he suffered, so shall his followers. Just get that. Arm yourself with it. I will suffer. The king, the leader of everything, suffered and died on a cross. 
and was rejected and spit out by this society. You cannot figure out a way to follow in his footsteps and be loved and liked by this world. I'm asking you to put that down this morning. Quit figuring out how to fit in and how to be liked and loved in this world. You don't want everyone in your office to say he or she is a really good guy or girl. That's not a compliment. Get armed with this mindset that all who desire to live godly in this world will be persecuted. Christ suffered, and we shall follow him down the same Calvary road. You've you got to count the cost. We've pre presented this Christianity that will give you a happy, better life and all of these things. This is a call to suffer, and you're going you're gonna to get spit out, and you've got to decide, is Jesus worthy? The one who suffered for me, is he worthy to stand for him by word and conduct as I enter into this world? Or am I going to just keep figuring out how to be quiet and how to be accepted and how to keep this thing secret? You're at a crossroad this morning. And I'm asking you to arm yourselves that Jesus Christ suffered and died for you. The second way to arm yourselves, if you'll look with me in verse 1, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Another tricky translation. We don't have time for the whole thing, but uh, Peter seems to like these kind of statements. I've never noticed this before. Baptism now saves you. He went and preached the spirits now in prison. Uh, and now he throws out that we've ceased from sin. Uh, this ceased from sin is where this whole perfectionist doctrine comes from, that we're going to get to a place where we sin no longer on this earth. And this is the, the verse, one of their main ones that they go to. And so the, the commentaries that I have took some different views on it. And it's worth just throwing out a couple of them as we journey. Remember last week I said, if you'll stay with me, we're going to get some gold. We got gold last week. Same thing. Stay with me. First one, when you die, you will cease from sin and, and, and make this your mindset then to be a martyr. That, that just uh, when I die, sin will finally be done. So set yourself with a martyr's mindset. And then there's some truth in that, but I don't think it fits the context. Uh, I don't, I, they're getting ready to die in the hands of Nero, so it's a small possibility, but I don't see that in the flow. The other is he's talking about Romans 6. And Romans 6 says that the dominion of sin, when you were joined to Christ, has been broken. That, that absolute ruling power that sin had over you has been broken. And so it's, it's remaining, but not reigning any longer in your life. And so verse 2 now you can actually do where he's going to say cease from sin. And so there's some merit to this. I think there's even a little piece of it. But where I'm going to go with this is this third point. I think Peter's saying this. Since you have been born again to a living hope, though you do not see him in verse 8, you love him. You love Christ and you trust him now. You, you seek to be obedient from the heart. you got a new heart and from your heart you want to obey Christ. And you embrace the cost of suffering at any price. That's the new birth. Jesus, I'll follow you. Though none go with me, I will carry this cross. I'm going after you. And so it's obvious then, if you have that, that you made a break with sin. If you sit here this morning with that, that I love Christ and I'm going to follow him, though none go with me. That if you have that, that's, that's going to show that you have made a break with sin. You have ceased from sin. No one gives up the smiles and the favor and the approval of this world unless you have died to sin and its dominion. Romans 6, you will not do this unless you've been born again because everything within the natural man wants to fit in this world, be loved and be accepted. This whole world is based on spending every penny you have to be loved and accepted. And when someone will come out willfully now and be, a, be rejected, a loser, who wants to do that? You do that and you're showing that you've made a break with sin. You have been set free from that dominion of just having your umbilical cord attached to this world and finding all of your hopes, dreams, strokes, everything from this cosmos. This shows that you've been born again. So if your righteousness is just all comfort and ease 
and being secret disciples. Just all this is, is God gives us our best life now. You haven't made a break with sin. If that's all you're about and that's why you came to Jesus, you did not make a break with sin. It is still your friend. And you will sacrifice pleasing God for the approval of this world again and again and again. Whatever it takes, if it's pleasing Jesus or getting the world to please be pleased with you, you're going to pick that every time. And so we're dealing with some difficult things here this morning. Very difficult things. When you will suffer for being aligned with Jesus Christ and pay whatever the price, even possibly martyrdom, you know that you made a decisive break with sin. And the bondage of sin over your life has been broken. I'm not in bondage anymore. And some of you might be sitting here and you've been in the church 20 years and you're still in bondage. Your, your whole life is you just like it here. You like where everyone agrees with what you agree with. And you have never went out into this world and tried to shine this light and live for Jesus at any cost. There's never been any sacrifice to your, to your cost of this gospel. And this morning, these are some hard words. These are some hard words that Peter is penning to a group who are about to die for the gospel. I grew up at a Catholic school called Our Lady of Fatima. And we had a group of friends there that uh, were, were my life. And all of us, in a, in a nice way, got kicked out of this school. And... We all ended up in public school together, and uh, Wheatridge High School is where I ended up, and this group became my life. Is we did everything together, and we're, being unbelievers, one day you were in, and one day you were out, and you never knew why. And what you started to find is my, my, for me to live is to be accepted by this group. My life is the smile and approval of my clan that I hang out with, and then all of a sudden in college... I got saved and something radical happened. Their approval became less uh, and their eternal souls became greater to me. And I started going out with them to be a soul winner, to preach this new gospel that I had found. And I'm going to these parties, preaching Jesus Christ, meeting with them one-on-one -on -one to do anything I could. I was crazy. And sure enough, I was rejected as quick as I was accepted in kindergarten. And, it, and what it showed to me is that I had, I, had, I had had a break with sin. The dominion of their acceptance and their approval had been broken in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And now all I wanted was the approval of God. This is not perfection. There's not one of you sitting in here in this room who's done this perfect. Jesus did it perfect. But a break from the bondage of the approval of this world must take place in every believing heart. So that now we will suffer for his name. You will never suffer for the name of Jesus if you're in bondage to the approval of this world. You'll never do it. When you look at the cross, it never set you free. It never broke the chains of this world. They're still around your heart. And you just added Jesus to a heart that wants this world to love it and approve it and accept it. Guys, we need to be armed. Because we've made a break with sin, we have ceased from sin and its tyranny and its dominion. Amen? Peter's going to flush this out a little more. What does it mean to cease from sin uh, in these following verses? And he's going to nail it down even more. So I'm sorry, it's going to get worse. Okay, anybody want to leave? Don't. Don't leave. Let me get you a few more times. Verse 2. This is the hardest verse in this section. Third way to, to take this and arm yourself with it. So as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. So what does this mean? Well, you're saved and the time that you have now from justification when you get saved and God declares you not guilty till the time you die is what we're talking about right now. So in the time that I hope every person in this room has from saved until you die, that's your time in the flesh. So we will no longer in this time that you have as Christians in this world live for the lusts of men. And what Greek word do you think he picked again? 
Epithumia. He loves that word. And that thumia, if you're new, is a desire. And it could be for a good thing or a bad thing. But an epithumia is when it becomes an over-desire. And so now I've got this over-desire for my lusts and to have the things that I want. I want them more than God. So my epithumia should be for Jesus Christ. And instead, we all are battling these epithumias in life that we start wanting more than Jesus Christ. And Peter says so boldly that you're not going to live any longer for your epithumias. That's not why you're on this earth. That's not why I saved you to just chase epithumias the rest of your life. Back to 1 Peter 2, 11. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from epithumias, which are waging war against your soul. You're done. You're done with your epithumias. If your life is just flat out living for whatever your flesh desires, if I want sin, I do it. There's no fight. There's no resistance. You have made a peace treaty with sin. And that's your Christian life. Whatever I want, I do. It doesn't matter if it's against the will of God. My epithumias are what drive my life. They're the sovereign of everything. Whatever I want, I do it. No greater desire by looking at the one who suffered for you in his place on a cross. I just live according to my epithumias. In Romans 8, Paul said, the mind set on the flesh, what? Must die. Must die. If you live your life according to the flesh, being controlled and dominated by it, all your life is, is whatever I want, I go after. If I want sex outside of marriage, I'll do it. If I want to indulge in any kind of food I want and overeat it, I'll do it. Whatever I want, is what drives my life. That is the sovereign of my life. Peter says you've been born again to a living hope from dead hopes. And all these epithumias are dead hopes. They're dead. They're going to get you nowhere. You've been born again to this living hope in Jesus Christ by the resurrection of the dead. And Peter says that's got to affect the way you live. You were dead And so you lived according to epithumias. You've been born again. That's got to change something about you. I've been made new. I've been born again. What do I go after? What is your desire? What is your purpose now? My life is not to live for my epithumias any longer, but I've been crucified with Christ and it's no longer I who live. But the life that I live in this body, the rest of your time in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's what I live for now. That's my, that's my epithumia. If you'll look with me, though, in verse 2, there's a but. I don't want you living the rest of your time in your flesh for your epithumias, but what do we live for? On the complete opposite, I want you to live for the will of God. There's something else that has taken up the heart of a believer. And guys, it's not my lust. As when I was an unsaved Gentile, And all I lived for was my lust. There's something new that I've been born again to. And that's the will of God. I want to obey the will of God. Is that a passion in your heart? Is that what drives you? How do you know you've been born again? I want to live for the will of God. That's what's happened in the new birth. I want to be in submission to God and whatever he brings into my life. I'm done fighting and manipulating and controlling. I just... I submit to God and who he is and what he brings into my life. This is my new preoccupation. This is how you arm yourself to suffer at the hands of this world. You say, what is the will of God? And it's to go into this world and go shine this light at any cost. That's the will of God. And go do it humbly and graciously and kindly and mercifully the way Christ did and truthfully as Christ. And we have spent months looking at it in regards to the mistreatment of the world. The government will mistreat you, bosses, spouses, people in the church. And we give a humble submission to this. 
Guys, that's how we're going to arm ourselves. I'm done with epithumias. And I'm going to live for the will of God. That's what I've been born again to. I'm going to arm myself with that mindset. Thirdly, verse 3. I'm going to call it, we're done with consumption. For the time already passed is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles. They've pursued a course of sensuality, lust, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. Just another Friday and Saturday night in America. What is this saying? This is what it looks like when you cease from sin. When you, when you live in its bondage, you live according to your epithumias and your desires rule the day. And that list he just gave, that's what you were about. Sensuality and parties and drinking and all of that stuff. That's what you were after. And, and Peter says, arm yourself with this mindset that Romans 6 says this. You are now ashamed of the way you lived when you were, unsha- when you were unsaved. Do you sit here today saying, I'm ashamed of how I live my life without Jesus Christ? Or do you look at it as the good old days? Do you sit here with absolute shame for how you lived when you didn't know God? I hate those years. Shame. It's so sad to your heart. The way I lived in defiance to God all of those years, shaking my fist at him, chasing epithumias, I'm ashamed that there was a God who created me and gave his son and I lived like that in defiance for 21 years. And so I want you to hear this. If you're five years old, little kids, or if you're 50 years old, you've had enough time. And Peter's saying, stop. Stop. Don't give me this argument. I never got to sow my oats. If you've lived six months, you've had enough time. It's done. It's sufficient. Look at your life before Christ. This was how I lived when I was blind. When my heart was not taken away with the love of a crucified Christ in my place. Why would I go back to living in my insanity? Why would I go back and live that way any longer when I didn't know God? You've already had enough of that life. Why would you try to go back to that life? This whole notion is I want to show the world that I I can still have the same kind of fun that they have and go to heaven when I'm done so I can connect with them. Just throw that trash out. I can't begin to tell you how many times I've come across that in my lifetime. And they say, I want to enjoy my sin for a little longer. I'm not done yet. I'll get right later. I'm going to sow my oats. I'm going to repent in my old age. And there are a million things wrong with that, like the doctrine of election. Uh, But I just want to hit the one before us. If you have spent one day living that way, the time has been sufficient. You're done with it, Peter says. And maybe this morning God is speaking to you. Your so-called Christian life has just become doing whatever you want. All you want to do is fit in at school or in your neighborhood. You are running with them in the same excess of dissipation, wasting and squandering your lives. There's no difference in your life except that you profess Jesus Christ. Would you hear the Spirit of God this morning? Do you have ears to hear? Stop. Stop. The time is done. Enough already. Be done with that. The so-called freedom has brought bondage and guilt and shame and joylessness. True freedom is not to live for your lusts, but to be done with living for your lusts, but rather for the will of God. No matter what the cost, amen? No matter what the cost, I'll follow. Well, what is the cost? Look with me in verse 4. Sorry, guys, I'm going on forever. And all this, they are surprised that you do not run with them in the same excess of dissipation. And they malign you. 
If you do what the scripture is calling you to do this morning and you heed the cry that I just gave you to stop, to stop thinking it's okay and to just cease from sin and to enter into what God has called you on Monday, tomorrow, when they call you and they say, we're going to the bar tonight and we're going to watch some sports and drink beer until we're drunk. And when you have to say no to your boyfriend and you don't show up at their parties, you quit joining the office and their gossip and all their slander. And they're going to say, hmm, what happened to Jimmy? If your name's Jimmy, I'm sorry. I'm just pulling it out of the air. So don't write me a letter, Jimmy. What happened to Jimmy? Jimmy, where were you last night? Why haven't you been around? I've noticed you haven't been with us all week. What's going on? Well, on Sunday, my crazy pastor was preaching from 1 Peter, which is nothing new. He always does that since I came to the church. (laughs) And after his long introduction, he talked about it's time to stop sinning and running with unbelievers in their excess of dissipation. And the Spirit crushed me with what I have been doing. And I realized I've got to quit living for your guys' approval. I'm done with it. But I'm going to live for the one who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm done. Don't look for me at the parties anymore. I'm finished. And the other response could be, well, I've just been busy. Sorry, bro. That's a bad response. And if you do what I'm saying, verse 4 is going to happen. And Peter says, if you do this, you know what they're going to do? They're going to malign you. They're going to slander. They're going to make fun of you. They're going to twist what you're saying and say, oh, you're just so much better than us, aren't you, Jimmy? But I I watched you drink more than me last weekend, buddy. And they're going to make fun of you and they're going to slander you and they're going to do everything they can because they're guilty and they hate it and you're salty. And so they're going to come after you. They will malign you if you make this stance. Billy Joel, he's not a theologian. He said, I would rather laugh with the sinners than cry with the saints because sinners are much too fun. And that's what the world's going to say to you. And they're going to come after you and they're going to they're malign you. So you want to get, get maligned? You want to get a look? Stand for Jesus Christ. Teenagers, go this week. Go in, if, for those of you that are in schools, go stand And quit trying to be a little jellyfish just floating with your school and fitting in and looking the same as everyone else. Go stand for the one who stood in your place and bore the full wrath of God. Go stand at any cost for the name of Jesus Christ. Verse 5. I'm sorry. I'm having so much fun. Verse 5. They will give an account to him who's ready to judge the living and the dead. This is how you can suffer quietly and patiently when all the maligning begins because in such a way that they might get saved or ask you what is the hope because they know your hope is no longer the acceptance of men. They're going to know there's something different than you because your acceptance, your hope is not that everybody likes you. Jesus likes me and I am O. Okay, and they're going to ask. And what he's saying here then is here's how you endure all of the mocking and all the mistreatment. God's a judge. And in 1 Peter 2.23, it said as they were mocking Jesus on that cross, he kept entrusting himself to who? The one who judges righteously. He kept giving it all over to his father. I can just give my life away for your good because the father will deal with this. And he says here, they are going to stand before God. In judgment. It hurts. It looks like they're winning now, doesn't it? Believers suffer and die, and they say, see, it's the same for you guys. You guys go through all these hard trials too. Unbelievers are getting the upper hand. It doesn't seem fair. And if nothing happens to them in this life, as they malign you and ridicule and mock you and maybe even kill you, my friends, They're going to die, and they're going to stand before the judge who they've been mocking all of these years and all of his followers. And he's going to judge the living and the dead. That helps me give it over to God. 
and it helps me to want to keep shining because I don't want anyone. I don't care if they're mocking me or even kill me. I don't want them to spend eternity in hell. I want to keep doing God's way of how he saves people. So when you give this over to God, you can love the ones who are persecuting you. There's no other way to do that. Give it over to God. Look to Christ who suffered for you and get in there and do it. And I'll just read verse six and close. For the gospel has for this purpose been preached even to those who are dead spiritually, that though they are judged in the flesh as men, here's the gospel, they may live in the spirit according to the will of God. So just quickly, what this is saying is those who have mocked you, they will die and they'll meet a judge. And you're going to die and you're going to meet a savior. Which end do you want to be on? Which end do you want to be on? You will have 10 million years and have no less days to sing God's praise and to party and to celebrate and worship the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ forever and ever and ever. Your reward is going to far outweigh your cost. And so I'm saying, lose it. Lose your life in this world that you might find it. But if you find your life in this world, Jesus says you're going to lose it. And so there's the question this morning. Have I died to sin? And have I now, my, my life is to do the will of, of God. And I'll suffer anything to enter into this world and to shine this light of Jesus Christ. I'm not going to be a secret disciple. I'm going to enter in and I'm going to live this before the watching eyes of this world. So I will pay whatever the cost to follow Jesus Christ to glory. Arm yourselves, I pray, with this mindset. To God be the glory. And I'm praying that some of your chains will fall off. Who your flesh has been controlling you. And some, it might even be demonic activity. Where it's controlling and battling you. I had a case of that this week that was unbelievable. To watch the Lord deliver someone under that by reading 1 Peter 4, 1 through 6. And so I want you this morning to cease from sin, to cease from following your epithumias and just living any way you want. Don't believe the lie of modern day Christianity that you can live any way you want. There's a God who tells us how to live and he saved us so that we could live this kind of a life. And so let's close in prayer and ask God to set us free if any of us are in this hole this morning. Father, I thank you for these words. I thank you that the ones that were being written to were suffering to a degree that we don't know. And yet we look at the winds, they seem to be changing and we may be entering into those times. And so God, it starts tomorrow. Am I going to arm myself with the same purpose? Am I going to enter into this world as your servant, your doulos, your follower, Am I going to go and live the way that you lived? Am I going to go and show them a graciousness and a, a beauty and truth and a life lived well and, and speak truth into error and go in there and not be ashamed of the gospel? God, that we would be shamed for the gospel at any cost, but that we are unashamed of it. And I just pray, Lord, that the souls would be set free this morning who have learned how to secretly follow you and keep it hidden and not suffer any persecution. God set them free by your truth and your spirit this morning. God, I pray that we would be these kind of men, women, and children, and that because of Jesus Christ dying in our stead, God giving us so many beauties, all the heavenly blessings in Christ Jesus, God, I pray that our response is to arm ourselves with the same purpose of Jesus Christ, and we will enter at any cost into this world with the message of Jesus Christ. God, use every soul here in this room. And if there are any who have walked in here who thought as they walked in, they were believers in Jesus Christ. And they now realize they have never been born again because all their life is is for their own lusts. They will never suffer persecution for the name of Jesus. He does not mean that much to them. God, would you save them even this morning? Would that very thing bring them to their knees 
And they would call upon the one who is able to save to the uttermost all who draw near to you through Jesus Christ. God, I pray for those souls this morning. I pray that you will empower your saints through your spirit to go be these kind of men and women in this, this world. God, be with them. Uh, shine. Shine your glorious light into a dark world, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.